Hi everyone, welcome to a very special video where I talk about my writing over the last 10 years. So that's correct, I have been writing for 10 years. It's kind of surreal to say I started writing when I was 12 years old in May of 2014. It's currently May of 2024 and I'm now 22. So 10 years have gone by, which is a bit of a slight slight crisis, but it's all good. I have been planning this video for years at this point. So in today's video, I'm going to be reading excerpts from every single one of my complete substantial writing projects. So that includes novels and novellas written from ages 12 to 22. It's going to be super exciting. Originally, I had chosen to read the first 100 words of each work, the opening of each work, but I decided that because I've read those so many times on this channel. You can find the opening paragraphs in tons of my videos. I thought, let me do something different and read the first hundred words of the second page. Originally in this video, I was going to actually break down the crafts and talk about what I liked and what I didn't like. Now, 10 years into it, I don't really want to approach the video in that way. I just kind of want to celebrate the work because I think you can celebrate your work at any stage in the writing process. But maybe if people are interested, I can try to do a video talking about sort of the main differences that I found from year one of writing versus year 10 of writing. The first project we're going to be reading from is called Water Hemlock. So I wrote this when I was 12 years old in the summer of 2014. I started it in a little purple notebook and I'd bring it back and forth with me to school. It took like two weeks and it really started this journey. So this is the quick log line. A gifted assassin is tasked to kill her first love, which is so 24. Fourteen, I think. So this is the first hundred words of Water Hemlock. I briskly walk to the practice room, dreading what director Johnson wants to say to me. I near the entrance of the practice room, suck in a quick breath and walk in. She's standing there, scanning me. Her dark chocolate brown hair stops at the shoulders and hangs loose. Her steel gray eyes and pale lips give away that she's from the Endion passage. Her gray eyes pierce right into my soul as if she's seeing my every thought. Which honestly, like, this is, I low key A. Like, why is it kind of good? Uh, I love rereading my old work, especially the work of me when I was a child, because you get to see, like, how excited I was about writing. And this is so 2014, the description. We got the hair color, we got the haircut, we got the eye color, like, even, like, the color of her lips. Like, that's so 2014. I don't know. I love that paragraph. I think it's so fun to see what was important to me, like, what was important to describe back then. So that is pretty much the first thing I ever wrote creatively, page two at least. So the second project we're going to be reading from is a novella called The Dreamer, which Water Hemlock was also a novella. So The Dreamer I also wrote when I was 12, right after really finishing Water Hemlock. This was also 2014 and here's the logline. Drew, a human mutation whose dreams are deadly, also known as The Dreamers, falls in love with a human who is trying to kill her. Okay, this these are cool premises like that. I will read that now, to be honest. So this is the first hundred words of page two. Last night's encounter with that man replays over and over in my head. He was so determined. He was so fueled on revenge. I, of course, was the perfect target. A dreamer girl who looks nothing like 18 when you first glance at her. I made sure he's not on my trail anymore. He'll find another dreamer to seek revenge on soon anyhow. The yearly count is coming up. The date isn't set yet. The humans do this simply to find dreamers. Every single living person or dreamer must show up. Ooh, is giving the reaping? Like it's giving Hunger Games? At this age, I was reading the Hunger Games. I loved Slated by Terry Terry. If you know, you know. I feel like that's an underrated trilogy. And I also loved The Darkest Minds by Alexandra Bracken, which you will see inspiration when we get to Fostered. But anyways, I love this excerpt. It's so fun. I have not read these excerpts, by the way, like when I was collecting them for this video, like I purposefully didn't read them. So this is my first time reading them probably in like literally almost 10 years. And this writing is like so good at 12, like slay. Last night's encounter with the man replays over and over in my head. He was so determined. He was so fueled on revenge. Like, okay, repetition. Like, that's so good. I am very intrigued. And also like the idea of the yearly count, like a capital C count. It, that's so like YA dystopian in 2014. <laughs> I love it. And also the idea 
that like to weed out this like human mutation like like they force everybody to come and like sort of like into one area and like be logged and so I don't know like a census I don't in order to like weed out the human mutation like that's that's scary like that could be a good movie so the next project that I'm going to read from is called The Treated this was my final novella from that summer again the summer of 2014 was iconic I was still 12 years old and this is the log line after evading a reforming procedure called The Treatment Meg narrowly escapes the city and allies with Holden a young man who also evaded the treatment so here is the first 200 words of the second page I'm seeing him struggle I see how hard it is for him not to smile at me in reassurance. I see how hard it is for him to be so blunt with me. He grabs my hand and squeezes it. I take my advantage and give him a quick smile. I'll miss that, he murmurs. I'm going to miss my own smile, too. It's going to be stolen from me for the rest of my life. A blaring microphone booms on, ripping me from my depressing thoughts. Patient 214, patient 214, two minutes, the voice says me not the me at the end like the last sentence it's just like me <laughs> i love it okay that was so fun um also like the automated voice like patient 214 i'm like oh girl this is like my divergent rip hop i think i had never read divergent and i don't think i had watched the movie no i hadn't at the time so it's kind of funny how similar they are because like just this era of dystopian was quite similar, I think. So right now she's talking, Meg, her, her the main character, she's talking to her friend Colt, I think was his name, like, like a horse. Sorry. So the next project we're going to be reading from is my first novel called Perks and Drawbacks. Now, this was a really fun project for me because I started it at the end of the summer of 2014. You know how you always have like that iconic summer? The summer of 2014 was that summer for me. I was hanging out with my cousin. I was like listening to Katy Perry and I also was like just kind of coming into my personality in that summer and so it's fun to think of this project that I was writing toward the end of it and so I wrote this from ages 12 to 13 I finished it after I turned 13 my birthday's in September and again this was written in 2014 and here's the log line after moving to a new school three months before graduation Star Miller befriends an unlikely group and may or may not be falling for their leader Okay, so this is YA contemporary, whereas the rest were YA dystopian. You can see a lot of first person. I don't get out of first person until like 2018 or 2019, I think. So this is the excerpt. Right now, I'm pretending to listen to this girl, Kat, who's apparently talking about something about the populars. We met when she tripped me accidentally with the monster she calls shoes. And from then, she's been showing me around this new school, guiding me through the hallways without a break between sentences. And yeah, I moved in the smack middle of the school year, arrived here at the end of the day. Yes, I'm that kid. I know, we all have one of them, the ones that don't show up for a while, only appearing when they want to rattle the class systems. <laughs> That's so cute. You can tell, like, I had not been in high school. Like, when I wrote this, I was going into my last year of elementary school when I wrote this, which in where I live in Ontario, like, ends at, like, grade eight. So yeah, and high school starts in grade nine for us. So that's so cute. That was, oh, this is my first shot at writing contemporary. And I really love this book. I was so like autistic about it. Like not even kidding. Like I didn't understand the autistic joy that came from writing at the time. I literally based my Halloween costume off of this book that year. Like I ended up like, painting like a thing like an arm sleeve with like symbols that matched each character so clearly like this this book mattered a lot to me and uh, it was just like a little little romance was anybody around for on Wattpad like it all started with an apple does anybody remember that that was like the main inspiration behind Perks and Drawbacks and also I think this is the first novel I ever named the other ones I named retroactively but this is the first one that I named like in the moment so that's kind of fun so the next book that we're going to talk about is one that gets spotlight all the time on this channel I will link the video where I talk about how I accidentally wrote a 10 book series in the description but I'm so excited to read more of Fostered because I talk about it a lot but I haven't actually read a lot of the project actually like book one so this is the start of an 
replacement era, and this is the logline for Fostered. An ex-con accused of murdering her sister is isolated and on the run until she forms an alliance with a group of young fugitives. Which is like such a cool way to describe Fostered. Like it was not that cool. It's just like a Darkest Minds like ripoff because I loved Darkest Minds when I was a teenager. But you know, like if you weren't writing a ripoff at age 13 in 2014, like where, where were you? You know what I'm saying? So this is page two. A soft glow of light illuminates the room, shattering the darkness into light. I can't manage to see the source of the light, which only heightens my guard. I point the still-loaded gun at the first thing I see. A boy who looks a bit older than me, with what I make out to be honey brown hair. It's Harrison. I don't have any experience with guns, but my bluff is enough for the boy to draw pale. I back away, making sure no one is behind me this time while taking in my surroundings. Okay, Reeve. So this is so fun to me because this is obviously the basis of the series that rules my life now. I'm still writing with these characters. And it's so fun to see where they started. Harrison, oh my gosh, a boy who looks a bit older than me. That is such a YA way to describe something. Honey brown hair. That's how I described his hair color. I remember taking literally like half an hour to try to figure out what Harrison's hair color was because I didn't know how to describe it even back then, which is so relatable because I still don't know how to describe it now. So we're in the same place. So the next project I'm going to read from is This Is Where the End Starts, which I wrote at age 13 from 2014 to 2015. This is a project that I wrote between the Foster series, which is so interesting. So not all of them are sort of in order. This book kind of came kind of smack in the middle. So this is the log line for This Is Where the End Starts. Quinn, a budding writer, is focused on caring for her ailing grandmother when her fictional character comes to life. And this is the excerpt. This is about her describing her best friend. This is Marilyn defined as if her name had been written in a dictionary. Boy crazy, overly excited, a tad irrational, with a dash of glitter because in her eyes nothing is complete without the messy flakes of shimmering plastic. I don't entirely enjoy spying on brand new kids who can slap a creeper status over me, I say truthfully, popping up my document again. She frowns at me, closing Simeon, narrowing her eyes at me when I begin to protest. Please, Quinn, Pretty, pretty please with a cherry on top, extra glitter for fun, she asks, holding up her palms in a silent plea. This is so cute. I love it. And honestly, like, I could just publish that now. <laughs> like, it's, it's very well written. Oh my gosh. I love the glitter. Like how she says, with a dash of glitter, because in her eyes, nothing is complete without messy flakes of shimmering plastic. That bit is a little awkward to me, but like, I love the dash of glitter. Ooh, that's so good. And I love the friendship. I, I hadn't written like best friends, especially not like best female friends in a while. Honestly, this is kind of sapphic. But anyways, I just love the dialogue. I love how fluffy it is. And honestly, I was doing a young adult class. I should have done this project. It was such a cool concept too. So the next book we're going to read from is Hunted, which is fostered book two. I wrote this at age 13 in 2015. So we've officially entered the 2015 era. And this is the logline. A gleeful reunion for Reeve, Harrison, and Foster turns bitter when they realize they're being hunted by a vicious group of agents. Did someone say Logan Clark? So this is fun because this is like the first sequel I ever wrote. So this is the first 100 words of the very first sequel. It's not entirely fun. This breaks my heart more than anything to do. To be separated off from the people that you're so comfortable with and to be faced with those who you despise isn't the best. That's so funny. But I've learned so much about our little waffle group just from being separated off from them. I arrived here in March after hopping from place to place with Foster and Riss for a few more months. Me leaving, them leaving, it was sudden and unexpected of us, but we were okay, and I like that. Ooh, I like that, how conversational that voice is. I think it was so interesting, I think, to like jump back into the same character's voice a second time, because obviously I'd never done that before. And so I think getting back into Reeve's head, you know, for the first time writing a sequel was a new experience for me. So it was also fun to also have to learn how to convey exposition between books. And that's what this section is. Speaking of fostered, we're going to read from Resisted, which is book three. And I wrote this from ages 13 to 14. And this was in 2015. And content warning for the excerpt, there is mention of blood as well as a corpse. So this is the log line. After being captured by Lonin's team, Reeve, Harrison, and Foster cut a deal to work with him in exchange for a criminal pardon. This is so funny because I rewrote this scene 
into sunless ground nearly 10 years later. You've got to be persistent with it. Some of them are in for a fight and make really convincing arguments. But you have a job, he tells me, staring at the now dead and bleeding out girl that's at the tip of his boot. And you need to go through with it. My eyes fall over to the girl again, a ripple of nausea running through me as I stare at her open blue eyes. They're losing their vibrant fire they had seconds before this, slowly dying, 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 dead. Ooh, Lonin, the Lonin dialogue. That's That was him talking, if it wasn't clear. I, I put this scene recently into Sun This Ground, but I, I made Harrison be sort of like Lonin's scene partner here. It's so fun. I love how I experimented at the end with the sentence structure, slowly dying, 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 dead. Like, I feel like, okay, girl, you're coming into your style here. <laughs> We're actually gonna shift back into a non-fostered project with I'm Disappointed, which I wrote at age 14 and between the years, I think 2015, and I finished early 2016. This is the log line. Struggling with an alcohol addiction, 17-year-old Clifford has determined himself a disappointment to his parents and a total social outcast until he befriends a new girl at school. This was like a really big project for me. I thought I was going to publish it. I had worked really hard to write it, but I honestly, I'm really happy that I didn't because I just don't think I understood how to write any of the things that I was writing at that age. I was very young, but I had entered like a pitch contest with it. I was a finalist for that pitch contest and it was, it was really cool, I think, to spend like about two years of my life, like really dedicated to a project. So this is the excerpt. I don't get to finish my free writing paper because by then English teacher extraordinaire and winner of this year's most hated teacher award, Miss Farley has ripped it from my hand, shaking her head as she reads it over. For a minute, I hold my breath, internally cringing over what she's thinking about me at the moment. Here's the thing. Her and I don't have a good teacher-student relationship. Why? because she's a grumpy ass middle-aged woman who uses her inability to find a husband as fuel for her hatred towards me. That's kind of misogynistic. <laughs> okay, um, I don't agree with you on this. That's, girl, okay. Um, Clifford, that's rude. <laughs> I ended up shelving it, I think when I was 15 or maybe almost 16. I just realized I had kind of outgrown it, but it was a really important book for me. And one of the characters that I was closest to at the time is kind of like a little emo boy. And um, I really needed that, I think. Like as a teenager, this is when I was in my first year of high school. I just kind of wanted to write all my like angsty emo teenage feelings out. And I did it through Clifford. Back to Fostered, we're at Hollowed, which is book four of the series. I wrote this between ages 14 and 15 from the years 2016 to 2017. And like I said, the whole video explaining the full Fostered series from beginning to end is linked in the description. It's like a literal movie length video if you want all of the lore. <laughs> so here is the log line. After a traumatic event, Reeve, isolated and carrying painful demons, struggles to adapt after reuniting with her allies. So this is the excerpt. The cigarettes aren't mine. I found them in the woman's truck, wedged between two seat cushions. The pack's squashed and worn, but inside lies two perfect rows of twelve perfect cigarettes. My hands start shaking. But still, I find whatever strength is left in my body and shake one of them out, holding it tight in my hand when it falls into my palm. I'm holding my lifeline and my killer, grabbing the cracking black lighter stolen from her purse. I flick the flame on watching the bright orange wave back and forth in the wind. Ooh, you can see my style developing, like imagery. That's good. I love that. I'm going to steal that and put that into this on this ground. <laughs> I actually have no idea what's happening here. I don't remember this book, so I, I don't know what she's doing or why, but uh, I, I, I guess she's, she's going through it. So speaking of going through it, book five, here we go. This is Splintered, which I wrote at age 15 in the year 2017. And this is the log line. The fostered squad reaches some level of normalcy and turn their focus to rebuilding their splintered relationships until Lonan experiences a mental health crisis. This is a book I wrote when I really needed it emotionally because I didn't really understand like what I was kind of going through as a teenager. <clears throat> I'm undiagnosed autism. And so uh, Lonan was like a really great help in terms of being able to channel my feelings through him. And so this is the book we got. His eyes are bright red and not the type of red our eyes turn when we're exhausted. The whites are almost bud-like in color, bordering the natural mud green. My first instinct when I really see them is to look away, but somehow as his gaze stays on mine, I don't. I don't care, he replies, voice syncing up with the image of the boy sitting ten feet in front of me. Looking at him for one last second, I try to pick beneath the wall he's thrown over himself, see straight into him. Wow, I feel like the jump from like, not even like, like from I'm disappointed, even from like hollowed, 
to, to, to splintered, like you can really tell a difference with the writing and like sort of the confidence and the variations in sentence structure and sort of sinking into a bit of a style. I tried to pick beneath the wall he's thrown over himself, see straight into him, even the M dash there. Wow, that's really cool, impressive. I know 15 is when I started to feel really comfortable in writing, so this makes a lot of sense to sort of see that development. And speaking of development, we're on to Fostered Book 6, which is called Rewired. I wrote this from, I think, age 15 to 17. It might have been 16 to 17, though, from 2017, late 2017 to 2019. I do think it was 16 to 17. This is the book where I found my writing style, or how I say it. It took a long time. It took like a year and a half to draft this book because... I ended up kind of tumbling into a style that I didn't really know what to do with it because I was like, I found this and also like, I'm not sure if I really want to write dystopian anymore. I kind of want to write literary fiction. So it was quite a transitional book for me, but it was one of those like really impactful moments in sort of my writing thus far. So the log line is, Reeve and friends are not getting along. After months of interrelationship conflict that has jarred them apart, Reeve finds solace in a new friendship in Darren until it turns into something more. Eh, not the something more. Not them getting married and someone's grand. Oh my god, they're engaged now. So this is the excerpt from Rewired. This is Reeve talking about Harrison. In the past month, since him and Lonan's arguments, I've noted two things. First, Harrison's managed to make friends with the other kids, including Maggie and her sister. I don't know the details of his new alliances, but from the looks of it, Everyone outside of our inner circle accepts him with ease. Second, he's sort of in a perpetually bad mood. Snaps too often, doesn't care to hang out with Foster and I, even when we've invited him. He splits his time three ways, by hanging out with Emily, catching up with the other kids, or sleeping. <laughs> he's so real for that. And what's funny is the Harrison she's talking about is the Harrison that, that you know from the novellas that I talk about all the time. It's crazy. He's the same age. It's crazy that it's the same timeline. Wow, that's that's wild. So yeah, Rewired was a really important book for me. It caused me a bit of grief because I was really changing as a writer, or, you know, understanding myself more as a writer. But it was one of the projects that I really needed to write. It, it's, it's quite like got growing pains. You can see it kind of shift genres really obviously, but I kind of needed that. So next, let's read from Mothwork. So this is exciting. Mothwork is a project I talk about on this channel all the time. This is a book that I wrote from ages 17 to 18 from the years 2019 to 2020, which is crazy because it feels like 2020 was just a year ago, but like that it wasn't. Now Mothwork marks the first book I wrote outside of Reeve's point of view in many years. As you could see from the timeline, I had been stuck in her head writing just the Fostered series for several years. So we finally jump into Harrison's head and we also change point of view for the very first time. So here is the logline of Mothwork. Isolated at a cabin, Harrison and Lonan's complicated relationship is tested when they find a photograph of a woman they believe is connected to Lonan's past and set out to find her. I have a whole video talking about Mothwork if you want to learn more about it and also its sequel feeding habits which we'll talk about in a second all of it will be linked in the description but this was like the first literary fiction novel that I had written really yeah ever this is the first one so it was really important I think for my development it was also my first time writing in Harrison's point of view it was my first time really like intentionally writing queer literature and so it's just like a big like sort of anniversary project for me it means a lot to me and I finished it I started it when I was having a really rough time my last year of high school and then I finished it at the end of my first year of university so it was is a great project for me so this is the excerpt he crouches and brings the flashlight with him shining it under the cabinet dust bunnies and forgotten pencils brush his wrist but he locks his fingers around the lighter and pulls it out it slides out with a skate bringing along a postcard sized photograph with it Briss brushes both off and rises delirious he turns the photograph over and shines the flashlight on it. It's scratched and developed wrong, little bits of orange obscuring the woman's face. A dark bob and bangs in her eyes, jewelry hanging from her septum. Her sun shades enough to reflect the vaguely European street behind her. The discreet jet of ink on her skin, blues and greens peeking out from under her sleeve. I feel like you can really tell I got super comfortable in my writing style by the time I got to Mothwork, which is so funny because I was so insecure about the writing the whole time I was writing Mothwork. When I'm reading this now, I'll be like, I would I would write that right now. Honestly, it, it seems very similar to what I write now. And it's so exciting to read sort of the beginnings of what would become me 
right now. Um, I think you can tell there's so many great details, man, like the dust bunnies, the pencils, even the word, like it slides out with the skate, like the skate, that's beautiful. And then like the, the picture, like the blobs of orange obscuring her face, the jewelry hanging from her septum. I love this phrase, vaguely European street. Oh, that's cool. I love that word, vague, discreet jet of ink. Okay, Emma Klein. Like, <laughs> I love that. This is so good. So we're going to read next from Feeding Habits, which is the sequel of Mothwork, which I wrote between ages 18 to 20. I wrote it from 2020 to 2022. It was the subject of a lot of inner turmoil in my writing process. I will talk about it in my next video, sort of celebrating 10 years of writing. But I had a lot of sort of emotional crises when it came to writing this book because I was changing a lot as a writer. I was experiencing a lot of insecurity. But here is the logline. Lonin, stuck in a toxic relationship, and Harrison, disappointed by his New York City restart, find themselves on separate trajectories toward inevitable isolation until Lonin finds purpose in helping out an old friend and Harrison realizes his dull reboot could be revitalized if he seeks what or who is missing. So this was so cool because I, at the time, thought this was going to be like the last thing I really wrote talking about like Lonan and Harrison's romance. And like I said, I have a whole video explaining even this project too, if you want more details on it. Um, and it's so funny looking back on it now as I've written a bajillion novellas after <laughs> from 2023 till now um, to have revisited this these this world is so exciting to me. So the excerpt I'm going to read is in Lonan's point of view. So this is about him and his girlfriend, Eliza. Her sudden vegetarianism is not confusing to him. Eliza tries new things all the time, something he's learned after living with her for half a year. One time, she brought home four different kinds of dried beans to make into tea, and together they drank it atop the balcony. The Vegas strip crossed them, somehow tasting better. One time, they ate a variety of kudzu foods for a week because Eliza said invasive species had to be killed somehow, and so they spooned kudzu pudding into their mouths, kudzu root powder into their water, kudzu salads with salted almonds. One time, she put them on a heat ban and they ate only frozen peas, potatoes, raspberries, turned the thermostat down until every surface crackled. Ah, I feel like even more from Mothwork, you can see me settled into this style, sort of more comfortable, um, some more exploration and imagery, like the thermostat down to the surface is crackle. Ooh, that's one of my favorite things I've ever written. Honestly, that description of the countertops getting so cold. I absolutely love it. And I know I've gotten so many comments about the first line of Feeding Habits. It's like something about Eliza is vegetarian. The real fans, the real Feeding Habits fans will tell me in the comments, but if you want to read, read, quote unquote, the first four chapters of this book, I have them as audiobook chapters on my channel. You can find the playlist. I never finished recording them because I had like insane insecurity about it and it would make me like physically sick <laughs> to post them. So I stopped posting them. But um, one day I hope to revisit this project because I, I went into it with like a lot of hatred at points and I, I'm actually feeling quite like lovely about it like reading it right now so it, it helped me a lot it helped me learn how to accept my writing and that is one of the most important things that has ever happened to me let's read the seventh virtue which is also a novel that I talk about on here a lot I do a video describing the whole thing this is the contemporary fantasy AU of Mothwork and Feeding Habits is how I describe it. This is the logline. After a magical intervention goes wrong, an unmotivated millennial must find the seventh virtue, a mystical bird at the head of a magical family in order to save his ex-boyfriend's life. So Seventh Virtue is a book I wrote from ages 19 to 21 from the years 2021 to 2023. So I recently finished it about a year ago. And this is the excerpt. At the top of the staircase stands his roommate, probing a miniature potted cactus in one hand. Foster is an herbalist, so this is what he usually does, holds plants. But the sudden image of him jolts Harrison into their coat rack. This is exactly how he greeted Harrison that original Thursday, holding the ceramic plant pot. And this is exactly how Harrison reacted the first time, diving nose first into faux leather. If it weren't for the neighbor who walked by right then, peering into the exposed mudroom at the sound of the crash, They'd never have to reenact the charade, but of course that wasn't the case. 
So that's how we always greet Harrison now. The only way to live in the time loop without consequences. So this is the first exploration into genre fiction I'd had in literal years. The last time I wrote genre fiction properly was like about 2017. So I had wanted to just write a new project that would make me happy, <laughs> especially after struggling with feeding habits. I just needed something, a break, something to show me that I could enjoy writing again. And that's what Seventh Virtue was for me. And it's been so exciting because I'm still writing that series now. I'm writing Soundless Ground, which we will also read. But let's jump into Body Back, which was novella one of my explorations in novellas. I talk about Body Back in a video. It will be linked in the description. We're saying that a lot in this video. And here is the nug line. It's 2005 in Las Vegas and 21 year old Harrison is tired of routines of gods of men. On a mission to move past a complicated breakup, he's about to get recklessly indulgent and he's come to the right place. So this is a really fun novella for me to write. It was a resurgence into literary fiction, to be honest, for me, after several years off of literary fiction because I was really focused on Seventh Virtue. It was kind of nice to get back into this literary voice, especially after I'd left that same literary voice in Feeding Habits on kind of bad terms. It was really tough for me to finish Feeding Habits, and so it was nice to kind of return to this literary slate, feeling like a new writer in a sense several years had passed so I wrote Body Back when I was 21. It really is about being 21 so it was the perfect time to write it. And here is that excerpt. Technically everything in Harrison's life is easy. He lives in an easy apartment, sleeps on his mother's easy Chesterfield, eats over easy eggs for breakfast, watches easy infomercials every night from midnight to 3 a.m. Technically, the infomercials aren't necessarily easy because he watches them in French without subtitles, but it's entertaining to make up slogans. Cut away your problems with our wrapping paper cutter, yeehaw. So he doesn't really mind. And he's grateful for this, how unassuming his life has become barely a month after Lonin. Perhaps this is how he views things, in two simple parts. Not before Christ, but before Lonin, which, now that he considers it, might be the same thing. Anyway... <laughs> Body back is so stupid. Like the voice is so dumb. Ugh, I love it. It's so fun. I do have a video where I read the full first chapter. So if you're interested in listening to it, it's on the channel. And I also talk about the chapter, kind of debrief it toward the end for my podcast Afterdraft. So this is a really an important book for me in terms of being what started it all. It's a novella. It's about 30,000 words. It took me about four months to write. And it was just hugely important in this super transitional period of my life when I really needed a project like this. So it also started the series of three novellas, which I wrote in 2023. And the next one is called Hallowed Bodies, which I wrote also at 21. So this is the log line. Alone for a week in Las Vegas, Lonan feels trapped in bland domesticity until a strange encounter propels him to search for his missing younger sister. So Hallowed Bodies is such an interesting novella because it purposefully takes place at the exact same time. So the exact same week that body back takes place. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to see, well, what happens when two halves of one couple who broke up are in the same place at the same time, but not together anymore. So we get to see what Lennon was doing in the time Harrison was like at the club. So this is so tonally different to body back. And I feel sorry in a sense for hallowed bodies because it caught me at like kind of an emotionally difficult time in my life. I was really struggling with chronic pain at the time and also really struggling to like find a routine at home after I moved back from the West Coast. And so it was kind of tough on me to write this project. I ended up kind of taking out frustrations on it. And it really reminded me of writing Feeding Habits, which wasn't great. So it's nice to kind of look back on it now with kinder eyes. And here's the excerpt. He takes the long way home. The long way home entails cutting past a wedding chapel near Lewis until he nears a second wedding chapel by a dollar store. He then turns around and retraces his steps back to the church, then walks all the way to a cafe bakery in the arts district where he stands and watches patrons from across the street. A man always meets a woman. They swipe off milk foam mustaches, lean against each other to fill out a crossword. The sun sometimes hits their faces and pales their eyes till they're transparent like vapor. They never walk out together. 
Hallowed Bodies is such a fun voice because I hadn't written in Lauren's point of view in literally like three years when I wrote this. So that was kind of a nice surprise. And for the final novella in this trilogy was Changing States, which I actually wrote between the ages 21 and 22. I wrote most of it when I was 21, a good chunk of it. So I did finish it in early 2024, but I do consider it sort of just like a 2023 thing for me. So the logline of Changing States is, after a whirlwind romance devastatingly ends, Jeremiah moves back to his hometown in Maryland for support, only to receive word there's been a death in the family the day he's set to arrive. So Changing States is kind of like a sequel to Body Back. Harrison, who is the protagonist in Body Back, is seeing a guy in Body Back named Jeremiah. So Jeremiah had to get a novella after they ended up breaking up at the end of Body Back. I love Jeremiah as a character, so it was so nice to revisit him. And I'm only supposed to share 100 words, but this is certainly over 100 words. Bear with me. Now, as he fluffs his couch cushions and tosses an old Tupperware of lentil curry into the trash, he understands something shifted. Theo understood exactly what when he'd called her to tell her he'd be leaving for a while, but didn't need to specify. A little change is good, she said, the phone clearly pressed up to her ear. Something fried in the background, the popping oil obscuring her voice. Call me when you're home and unplug your appliances, the latter of which he does now. What he doesn't do is tidy his bed. He's been sleeping on the couch since late September because he knows what'll happen if he doesn't. Fresh ground cinnamon, a taut crest of shoulder, a laugh like jingle bells. Before he goes, he shuts his bedroom door. By the time he gets back, he might forget what happened there. One of my favorite, I think, sections of writing ever. I love changing states. I mean, Jeremiah has the love of my life. It feels crazy that I, I finished writing this so long ago because I still feel like I'm writing changing states. What a beautiful way to sort of close off that sort of trilogy of novellas. Now we're moving on to Sunless Ground, which is actually book two of Seventh Virtue, which we talked about a little while ago. Yes, we're going very chronological. I am currently writing this. So I started this at age 22. Actually, I might have started it at 21, actually, right before I turned 22. So from 2023 till now, I'm currently still drafting it. It's about 150K into the draft. Content warning for a dead animal that shows up in the excerpt. But here is the logline of this book. Tenuously clinging to survival and desperate to reunite, Harrison makes internal allies at the seventh roost when Lonan escapes without him, while Reeve searches for the fourth virtue when Darren mysteriously goes missing. I mean, this is my current project, so this is really fun to read. It's kind of awkward. I'm like, oh, this is what I'm currently writing. So this isn't Reeve's point of view. Her jaw slackens as she looks to the white spruces lining the property, uncharacteristically still like they too are in mourning. The sun is gauzed by clouds and will set in an hour. The night will fall and a new day will begin. Something changed in these dense woods, even if she's the only one who cares. Reeve turns to the animal. Hours ago, it was still alive, hopping from slat to slat on the stairs twitching its nose, its eyes alert as rubies. Come the dawn, she thinks instinctively, but there's no use. A mantra, a prayer. Whatever she believes words can do won't help. The rabbit is dead. So this is such a fun, I think, opening. I mean, it's, it's sad, but like it was so fun for me to write because I hadn't written a novel opening in Reeve's point of view. <laughs> oh gosh, that was like in genre fiction in years. So it's been really fun to like make her more of a central narrator and it's on this ground. So I can't ask for more. This is like one of the most fun books I've ever written, even though it's like quite boring, like in plot. So the last project we're going to be reading from is called Lost Gods. This is sort of like a sequel to Body Back. It follows the same character. So a content warning for suicidal ideation in both the logline as well as the excerpt. So maybe skip past this one if that's sensitive for you. Building the remains of two breakups and at the genesis of a new life in Manhattan, Harrison, alone for a week in the city, is ready to die until he meets an older artist whose intensity provides the distraction he needs. So this is a really interesting project for me because I'm not really taking it seriously the way I did the other novellas. I was very rigorous with the writing process for the previous novellas, and I didn't want to do that for this one. This was supposed to be a short story. It is now a novella. It's over 10,000 words long. <laughs> I have been writing it on and off since October. So it's been really fun to delve back into this voice, but in a more casual way. And I've written most of it in my notes app and by hand, which is so exciting. So this is the excerpt. He hops onto the building's ledge, spreading his arms wide as he mentally repeats Hung Up's chorus, exhaling to the pulsing drumbeat. You can do anything in New York City and no one will stop you. In a minute, 
He could close his eyes, inhale the brisk singe of car exhaust, think of his mother and plummet to the sidewalk below him. He could become the bones he's been promised to return to, a quick biohazard to sweep up. The city never sleeps and he wouldn't make it pause, not even for a second which could be a comfort. That is the end of the excerpt and also the end of this video. I hope it was helpful to just see the change of each excerpt over time. I can talk about things that I've noticed in terms of like improvement, but I also think there's sort of like an intrinsic improvement, quote unquote, because, you know, as a child when I started writing, so there's going to be sort of development over time. So I'm not sure if that would be helpful. If you want to let me know exactly what you might want to see for more of like a discussion video, but I just wanted to put the excerpts out there. Let's chat about them in the comments. What do you guys notice? One of the most important things that I think a writer can learn is that you improvement, quote unquote, it comes over time. Sometimes the best way to learn things is just to practice, to make mistakes, to write things that you don't love, to write things you do love. And so sometimes just writing a lot can help and writing over time can. And I think I'm in a bit of a unique situation where I have all of my writing from start to finish. So I was like, I need to take advantage of this and sort of make a video and show people uh, sometimes you can't get to point Z without going through the whole alphabet first. So thank you so much for being on this journey. If you've been part of the last 10 years, thank you so much if you've ever said anything nice about my writing. Leave some of your writing in the comments below if you want and we can celebrate your writing too. But for now, I will see you guys in another video. Bye. Thank you.